upload it later. All right. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in. I'm excited to share and then see what questions you all have. Let me go ahead and share my screen and get us going. As we talk about maximizing the use of online collaborative trees for your genealogy research. Now, I will try to keep my eye on the chat in case you have questions that I can answer along the way. But if I miss it, we'll definitely be sure to come around um, at the end so that we can address any questions you have. So I want to start with um, a story. <laughs> so last weekend, I had the opportunity to go give a genealogy presentation in person, yay, <laughs> for the Indian River Genealogical Society. And it was over in Vero Beach, Florida, which is about three and a half hours to the east of where I'm currently at in Florida and had a great time doing the presentation. And afterwards, I had some time to go to a couple of antique stores. I love going to antique stores, shopping for, you know, items to be rescued, more or less. And while I was at the antique shop last Saturday afternoon, I was browsing old postcards and saw this postcard. And I, it, I paused on it because I thought that's interesting. It's an interesting structure. I, I'd never heard of it. It's called the Box Singing Tower. Um, and I, you know, I didn't get it though. I just like, this is interesting. I saw it was in Florida, um, but I'd, I'd never heard of it. But on the way back home, I was looking for interesting places to stop and learned that it was on my route back home. I'm curious to know if anyone has ever visited the Box Spring Tower, Box Singing Tower. You can go ahead and put it in the chat. But I was so excited. So this is a picture I took right as we were about to, right after we entered the gardens uh, with the tower in the back. So you can see just how high it stands above the tree line. This is a huge, huge, huge tower. And so this tower is amazing, y'all. It's 224 feet high, or 205 feet high, excuse me, and it has at the top a bell tower. It's it's a carillon bell. There are multiple bells, and they do bell performance, carillon performances a couple times a day, and the sound echoes across the, the whole area. And inside the tower are several components. There's a sound studio for the person who plays the carillon bells there's a library there's an archives there's a maintenance workshop water systems because the tower used to irrigate the lands of the garden and it's just a really cool structure beautiful outside made of um, different types of brick and marble and it's just a beautiful beautiful structure it was built by edward bach who was um, an immigrant to this country from the netherlands and he maintained some success as an editor of late the editor-in-chief of ladies home journal and used to winter in florida and so he wanted to build a sanctuary for his getaway here in florida and decided to build his gardens and build this tower and i'll come back to the tower shortly but i wanted to give you that background because Part of his messaging really resonates when it, we think about online family trees. Now, I want to start by also giving a basic definition of what I mean by online collaborative family trees. Now, this is a picture of just a forest picture, um, different trees in the forest. And many of us, as we work on our family trees, are very accustomed to using sites like Ancestry.com, uh, where we have our trees online on the site, but they coexist in the same site as other trees. Those other trees are separate from our trees, but they coexist together, just like trees in the forest. There are multiple trees that are independent of each other, but they coexist in the same space. So you have control over your tree or you have control over who you allow to come and edit or add or contribute to that tree. So you have a lot of control when you do that. Alternately, there is this concept of a one world tree. And I saw this, I saw this, I got this analogy from um, Mike Mansfield, who is with my heritage, and he, as he talked about the differences between sites like Ancestry and these one world tree sites. With a one world collaborative tree, the idea is there's one profile for every person. And everybody working on the tree works on the you all work on the same profile collectively. So it's not that I'd have a profile for my grandmother and then my cousin would have a profile for my grandmother. The idea is that there's one profile for her that we both collaborate and contribute to. So just like this one single tree in the 
in the lawn, I guess, it's one tree that multiple people collaborate on, one profile that multiple people work on collectively. So that's what I'm talking about when I say collaborative family tree, are sites where there's a tree, where it's on design and on purpose set up so that multiple people all contribute to the same profile. Now, I like looking at uh, the word of the day. And yesterday, as I was uh, editing the presentation, the Merriam-Webster word of the day was shenanigans. Appropriate, right? Because it was April Fool's Day, right? Shenanigans, people doing mischievous or um, different types of activity and behavior causing a little trouble, right? But not only is it perfect for April Fool's Day, it's perfect for some of the tension that many of us feel when we think about the concept of working on a tree where anyone can edit those profiles. I know many, many of us sometimes have hesitations because someone else can come along and mess up the data. And that is certainly not something that we want, right? We don't want people in there with sh playing shenanigans in, our tr in, in the tree. Now, sometimes it's not on purpose, but it does happen where there's misinformation put on tree profiles. There's a well-known comic from XKCD that I like to pull up every now and then where there's a person on the computer and says, someone says, are you coming to bed? And the person's like, I can't, this is important. And the other one's like, what? And the person's like, someone is wrong on the internet. I think many of us can say we have had that feeling. Someone is wrong on the internet. You need to correct it. You need to fix it, right? And that is part of the frustration of working with an online tree where multiple people are touching things. Yet we can keep in mind that when we are working with a one world family tree, it's not your family tree, right? We can avoid using language like someone messed up my tree. Someone messed up my family. I keep my tree on family search family tree. It's not your tree. Your people are on the tree, but it's an open tree. So I say that to, to say that sometimes it can require a shift in thinking about how we approach the one world tree concept. And to get back to Edward Bach, as I was leaving the gardens that day, there was a quote on, a, on the side of a wall that I really liked and it, it really resonated with me. And his quote was, give to the world the best you have and the best will come back to you. This is a quote that was important to him because he built the Bach Tower in the gardens as a gift to the United States for appreciation for what he gained. So his whole purpose in creating these gardens is that it was a gift. He was giving to the world. Um, he was just doing it because he wanted the world to have a place where people can come and just reside in peace and reside in beauty. So his whole framework was giving to others so that you know it would come back to you. So we'll come back to this quote. <laughs> So my goal today is to really take some time to give an overview of each website's features that we'll talk about and showcase the collaboration option because they truly are designed to be collaborative. So I want to take you through uh, what's available um, and maybe, you know, you might know some of it already. I know we have people here at different levels of understanding and knowledge. So I want to make sure that we're all at the same, uh, same place when it comes to understanding how the sites work. Okay, there are three major players in the space of this idea of a one world family tree where multiple people are collaborating. Those three major players are Wikitree, Genie.com, and Family Search. So those are the three platforms that we'll talk about today. And even though they all have this concept of a one world tree, they're, the way they work is slightly different from each one. So just like rainbows have a spectrum of color, they the, the collaboration and the features and the ability to edit on these sites are also on a spectrum. So they vary slightly from each other, and it can be helpful to understand the nuances of them each. So we'll start with Wikitree. So Wikitree, excuse me, Wikitree was um, developed in 2008. And the idea behind it, again, this is a one world family tree. 
everything is completely free on the site. So once you register, there are no costs incurred for using the platform. Now you can sign up as a registered user and they do ask you to sign an honor code. The honor code has several principles so that we all, we all have a baseline commitment to you know, not behaving nefariously, not getting up to shenanigans, right? That we're going to do our best to be truthful. We're going to do our best to appropriately and accurately represent the information that we're sharing and contributing and posting to the tree. And there's several other principles that they just ask you to complete. So they have this honor code that they ask all the registrants to complete before you are able to do any editing on the tree. As far as size, Wikitree currently has around 33 million profiles on this tree. So that's a lot of people. Of course, that's not everybody, right? And there's always room for growth. Now, Wikitree has a very interesting setup when it comes to who's allowed to edit and contribute to what. So I want to give you some background on that setup. If you've ever seen the movie, Meet the Parents, you may remember that Ben Stiller's character, guy in pajamas, right, on the right, is, you know, marrying his fiance and he has to contend with the father-in-law played by Robert De Niro. And Robert De Niro is very suspicious of Ben Stiller's character at a certain point in time. And he has this mantra that's repeated throughout the movie about being in the circle of trust. So there's a circle of trust and Ben Stiller is not in it until Ben Stiller is. So this idea of a circle of trust is something that Wikitree uses. There's a trusted group of people for some profiles, and either you're in it or you're not. If you're not in it, you're not able to edit. But if you're in it, you're able to edit. Let me uh, go through a little bit more in depth what that means. Every profile at Wikitree has a trusted list and a privacy level. Wikitree uses these in combination to help with establishing parameters around the editing permissions. So again, if you're not on the trusted list for a profile that requires one for editing, what you can see and do depends on the privacy level of that profile. Let's take a closer look. Every profile has an icon to represent where it stands with regard to the trusted list and the privacy protections. So I'm going to take you through what the icons mean because you'll see these on the profiles on the site. We'll start with the icon of a profile that's unlisted. This is one that is completely hidden from everyone except those who are on the trusted list. For example, this could be a profile of someone who's currently living but is not a Wikitree member. So it's designed to protect the information of that living person. All right. We also have a profile type that's private. In this case, there's very limited information that's viewable by the public, and Wikitree refers to it kind of like being listed in a phone book, right? You can see the name there, but you don't know much about it. Only the trusted list individuals can edit this type of profile. There is a private level profile with a public biography. So everything is hidden except the biography and its sources, but again, only the trusted list can edit. You have a private profile with a public family tree. So some information is viewable, but again, only those on the trusted list can edit. There's private with a public biography and a public family tree. So some information is viewable, but again, only the trusted members can edit. So those are the private levels. Now we're switching to the icons that show you the profile is public. This means anyone can view anything on the profile. However, there's still a measure of trust needed before you can edit. Then the most open type of profile is the one that's completely unlocked. It's called the open. And in order to edit it, you just register for an account, sign the honor code, and you can make contributions. Now, Wikitree does have some parameters they like to see in place. They like for non-living people without any sensitive information or any privacy concerns to be open, as well as profiles for anyone who's born more than 150 years ago or who died over 100 years ago. Those must be open. So most of the profiles on the site will be open. 
Now, as you interact with the information on the profiles in a tree, they do have wiki tree leaders who are very active and very diligent in monitoring what's going on in the tree and helping resolve conflicts and issues. So you can always reach out to a wiki tree leader and able to help um, resolve any conflicts that may occur or answer your questions. So let's take a closer look at Wikitree. And I'll do a search here for Koontz. So I typed in Koontz and it brings up a list of profiles with Koontz. And the names in the list are color coded. So if you see a name highlighted in green, that's someone who is a member of the site. If you have someone highlighted in pink, it's a, a woman highlighted in blue, it's a man. And then they have pulled some images from various profiles to show you along the right hand side. So let's take a look at the profile for the first person here, Elizabeth Koontz. So when I look at her profile, her icon is telling me that this is private. There is a public bio, a little bit of a public bio, but it's private. So it's this is kind of like the phone listing uh, information. You can see that she's there. She's a member. She just joined at the end of March, but you can't see any information about her. Here's another profile for a woman named Mita Bell Kuntz Terrell. Now her profile icon tells us that it's public, but trusted list members only can edit. So that means if I wanted to work on Mita's profile, because I do have a Kuntz surname study, I would need to get in touch with the manager of the profile and see if we can have a conversation if she might add me to the trusted list. So this profile has a little bit more restriction. Here's the profile of another person in my surname study, Christopher Columbus Kuntz. His is completely open. So his profile is public. Anyone can edit it, work on it, contribute to it, make changes. So you want to watch for these icons so that you can quickly at a glance know what level you're able to contribute to it. When we look at the standard view of a profile, you can see there's a lot of information going on on his profile. So you know, Wikitree is a wiki, just like Wikipedia, you can type in text and make edits and there's a little bit of convention you want to learn before you start making edits so that you are doing it correctly, but it doesn't take too much to learn those conventions, there is guidance on the site, but people can add all types of information um, using that wiki format. What I want to do is walk you a little bit through some of the options here in the navigation menu, not all of them, but highlight some of the ones that lean more towards the collaboration features. So a very important part of working on a collaborative tree, you want to be able to know when things have changed. So there is a tab for changes that allows you to see the history of edits to that person's profile. So if I'm looking here at Christopher Columbus and see his Christopher Columbus Koontz, look at his changes, I can see edits have been made in the past couple of months. It tells me the time it was made, who made it, what they edited, and I can even thank that person if I want to for their contributions. So it's very transparent so you can see when edits and changes are happening. You can also take a profile and categorize it to an existing group on the Wikitree list of groups. You may also recognize this being a feature at Wikipedia, where the articles on Wikipedia are assigned to categories. Same here. The, pro the profiles of people, sometimes places and sometimes things, can be assigned to a category. So in the case of Christopher Columbus Kuntz, his profile has been assigned to the category War of 1812. So if I were to go visit that category, I can see a list of more than 2,600 profiles that have been added to that category. So these are all individuals associated with the War of 1812. So that type of grouping can be very nice um, for collaboration because it allows you to have a more contextual view of that person. I wanna take just a second to talk about these categories that Wikitree does have. There are several top level categories, about 20 of them, but Wikitree wants you to be as specific as you can. So the idea is that you drill down until you get to a category that you want to use. I will use the example of my Aunt Ella. So here's my Aunt Ella. I just worked on her profile yesterday for the site and I wanted to categorize her to the school, the university that she attended. So I added her profile as a first step and then I can go down to the categories here and show you where I put her. I drilled down 
that category menu until I got to Elizabeth City State University. She graduated from there and I wanted to associate her with there. So right now she's the only profile associated with Elizabeth City State, but I've got several family members that attended the university. Um, I've done a little bit of research on some of the individuals um, administratively connected to the university. So I could edit their profiles and assign them all to this category and they would all be grouped together. So this is a nice feature for collaboration as well. Going back to Ella's record, I also want to show you about sources. Now, sources at Wikitree are important. They really want sources. And as we know, sources are important for documenting the knowledge that we know and the information that we gather about the people that we're researching. Sources at Wikitree will vary in format. Now, when I put in Ella's record, uh, the source I put was personal knowledge, Ella was my aunt, and that was just to create it, but that's not a very robust source, is it? I definitely need to make sure to come back and add more documentation to her profile. This is an excerpt of a source from Christopher Columbus Kuntz's page, a source list. As you see, it's mostly hyperlinks. This person has put the hyperlink to several databases at FamilySearch, as well as a hyperlink to the Find a Grave Memorial. Okay. It's better than just typing a note, but at the same time, there's more information that would be helpful to have about this particular source. Here's another excerpt of what a source looks like on a profile. In this case, the volunteer has gotten more descriptive for some of the sources, right? We see a more detailed listing of the find a grave record. We see mentions of publications from where data is coming from, but again, the format may vary. So as you're looking at profiles at Wikitree and you're adding sources potentially yourself, you have the flexibility to do the source as you want. However, Wikitree does prefer if we use the evidence explained format. You may be familiar with evidence explained. It's a, a style guide put together by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. And so Wikitree's guidance has information on how you can learn about evidence explained and how you can format your citations that way. But not everybody is gonna use evidence explained. So I just, I share this with you so you know, people can source, you can't source, it's just the formats will vary. Another powerful component of collaborating with Wikitree is the DNA features. Of the three platforms, Wikitree and Genie allow you to do DNA connections and Wikitree did it first. It was one of the things that set them apart and made them unique because when you have a profile, you can indicate if you as a tester are related to that person's profile. So this is the profile for my grandfather and I have done a DNA test and I've connected myself to that profile of his so that anyone browsing it knows he's had a genetically related family member do a DNA test. So you will visit some profiles and see long list of people who are, have done DNA tests and associated themselves with the profile. And that can help you as you're doing that type of genetic genealogy research. So this DNA connection and this aspect on the profiles at Wikitree is quite nice. Other collaboration features. You can do one name studies projects here on the site. So you, you saw how I showed being able to group a person to a category. It works similar to that. You can set up a project, without having to set up your own website, leverage that and do a one name study. Now, I've said already a couple of times, I do one name studies. I don't use Wikitree. I'm a member of the Guild of One Name Studies and I use a site that I have on the Guild site, but this is an option for a one name study. You don't need to set up a website. You can quickly get started, learn how to edit the profiles of the members here and add them to a one name study. And you can also do a one place study. So if you're focused on maybe a small a town or all the members in a community or all the members in a cemetery or at a school, you can do that type of cluster genealogy research using one, one place studies here at Wikitree as well. So that's Wikitree. <laughs> so I want to now move on to Jeannie. And I know there's lots of com conversations happening in the chat. Uh, let's see, I'll, I, I think I'll wait for questions to the end. <laughs> so. I've got it. Okay, thank you, Renata, so much. <laughs> All right, Jeannie. Jeannie was launched in 2006, and it is now owned by MyHeritage. It wasn't always owned by MyHeritage. They acquired it in 2012. The idea, again, a collaborative world family tree, one profile that multiple people can work on together. How large is Jeannie.com? 
177 million profiles as of yesterday. So Wikitree, 33 million profiles. Genie, 177 million profiles. So Genie's larger. When it comes to editing on the genie.com tree, most of the profiles are going to be public. Again, public profiles, open editing. There are, the, there are options to have private profiles specifically for a person who is living, uh, for persons who are minors, um, and in some cases, some people who have been more recently deceased. But in the, for the most part, the profiles on the site will be public. Anyone will be able to view a public profile. As you might expect, viewing a private profile has more restrictions. Editing of a public profile is going to be available for all registered users. Editing on a private profile, as you'd expect, is going to be more restricted. Now, Wikitree is completely free. Genie has a free tier, but there's also a paid tier. This is called Genie Pro. Genie Pro costs, at this point in time, almost around $120 a year to subscribe. And you can see the list of benefits along the right-hand side of what you get with the Pro subscription. So it's going to being that it's owned by MyHeritage, they do a lot of work to integrate with the MyHeritage databases and collections available on that site, and also the DNA features on that site. So there's connections there that MyHeritage is able to do because of the fact that they own this site as well. There's the enhanced search, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, unlimited media. If you don't have a paid site, you're limited in how much media, how many media files you can add to the site. You have, I think, one gig is your limit, but if you have a pro, you're unlimited. Now, I will say this. Enhanced search. <laughs> this is, I think, the most important uh, benefit of having a pro site. If you only have a free site with genie.com, you're not going to be able to see all the profiles on the site. They do restrict you from that. You need the pro subscription in order to even see all the profiles on the site. So to be more concrete, if I'm doing my Kuntz study and I want to find Kuntz's on genie.com, I could type Kuntz into the search, but I'm not going to see everybody. I'm only going to see a few and it will tell me, oh, sign up for the pro subscription if you want to see more. That is what they mean by enhanced search. You need the pro subscription in order to see everything. That said, because of this, I think genie.com tends to attract more serious genealogy researchers, right? Who are maybe less likely to mess up things, as we might consider it, but there is that barrier of having to have the pro subscription if you want to see everything. If you do not log into the site with your profile, there's limited information on what you can view. This is my grandmother's profile, and I'm not logged in for this screenshot, and. I can only see a little bit. When you click on view complete profile, that's when it asks you to log in. For her profile, I don't need to have the pay subscription, but I would have to log in to see everything. Once I log in, I can see more details. And I've got some information that I have amassed for privacy reasons. But one of the things that Jeannie does is at the very top of every profile, it tries to tell you if you're connected to this person and maps it out for you. So it tells me, Cora Mae Lawhorn is your grandmother. And it will do these family tree relationships for anyone who I'm connected to on the tree. So it may say, so-and-so is your you know, maternal great-grandfather, um, brother like it gives you it almost makes me think of that line from ferris bueller where christie's uh i've forgotten the actress's name but she's given like so and so and so and so said that he's out sick today right like it gives you this map string of relationships all right but what i want to do is take you along this navigation bar and again focus on the more collaboration options all right so here i am on the navigation bar we have overview media timeline discussion sources revisions and dna so i could have written an about bio for my grandmother, but any of my cousins can come and do the same, my family members. It's going to show her immediate family, and um, it links you to those profiles then. You have space for memories, you have space for statistics on the right, and so it tells you, you know, these little details that might be fun for you to know. Now, you can follow a profile. That's all of, also important for collaborative work. You want to follow and keep track of changes, and it tells you who's recently viewed it. There is a timeline view, which is nice because it gives you a chronological view of the events that have happened in that person's life, and you can filter and sort what options you want to see. 
your visions. Again, you want to be able to see changes. So at any point in time, you can click on a profile and see who's made the change, what the change was, when they did it, um, and then you know follow up accordingly if needed. DNA. So uh, you know we talked about WikiTree having that DNA. So does Genie.com. So I have attached myself to my grandmother's record as a DNA relative so that anyone who's viewing her profile will see I have tested and then we'd be able to leverage the tools at MyHeritage to look at those connections even more closely. Sources, also important, right? So here's a view of a source from uh, Christopher Columbus Kuntz. I went, no, actually, no, this is Charles Robert Darwin. I looked him up to get his sources. And I wanted to show you this because sources here tend to be rather expanded in view. Not only can you see the source, you can see every fact that the source substantiates. And so you'll have a list as you go down the person's profile page of the sources for that person. Now, another feature that sets Genie apart from others is this social feed. They, they were the first of the World Tree platforms to do it. Family Search now has one, but Genie Tree did it first. And so the idea here is I can invite my family members, my mother, my father, my siblings, all to this space, and they will see a social feed as events happen on the family tree. So let's say it's our grandmother's birthday, they'll get a notification for that. So if you use you know, Facebook, any social media site with a feed, it's, it's a feed. But the feed is specifically focused on the people in the tree and the events that are occurring for those people. In fact, my brother still gets notifications. He, he texts me sometimes about the messages that he gets. And then as you scroll down the, the page, there were other things you'll be able to see. So it tells me, oh, so-and-so's tree is not fully complete. It also shows me who I'm connected to has been recently online. So one of my connections was just online a couple of weeks ago. Um, that particular person is in my Coomp surname project. So I know, that person was working on the Kuntz tree. I, I could go to their profile and see the work they were doing. I see statistics about me and myself and my husband, and then I can also see my revision activity. So all that's presented to you in the feed. Now, collaboration, projects. Genie.com has projects set up. So these are groups of people all associated around a similar topic, for example, Mormon pioneers, or I just set one up as a test for Fisk University, and you can assign profiles to a project. For example, here's a fun one. It's called So You're on a Stamp. There are 1,200 profiles in this project of individuals who are all featured on a stamp. And so the idea is you could all work on these profiles together and you know have this conversation going because they're all on a stamp, but it's a way to group people together around a similar concept. Okay. Oh, and I realize I have my next slide out of order, but <laughs> this is sources for Charles Darwin. I did want to show you this after the Charles Darwin source because you can get very granular in specifying what facts the source substantiates. So I wanted you to have that. All right. So that is Genie. So we're going to round it out now with Family Search, Family Tree, which I bet many of you are familiar with. Probably used this is probably used the most, right? Family Search, Family Tree was launched in 2013, and it is provided as a uh, section of the FamilySearch.org website. Again, it is completely free. As of Roots Tech, they share that there are 1.47 billion persons on the tree. So WikiTree was 33 million. Genie was 177 million. Family search, 1.5 billion almost. So they, they monitor these statistics and they keep track of them. Uh, there's also 2.6 billion sources. This is the basic structure of the family search family tree. I'm sure it is familiar to you, but you can navigate the tree, zoom in and zoom out. But again, it's one profile that multiple people work on. This is the person page for one of my ancestors, Rufus Tannehill McNair. And it's divided up into different sections. So we get information about his life. We get photos that I, in this case, have attached to his profile. And I get his timeline and details about his family. That's under the About tab. If you move over to the Details tab, you're given the chance to see even more. Now, I purposefully collapsed these sections because I wanted you to see the 10 sections that comprise every profile on the Family Search Family Tree. So brief history, other relationships, other information, vital records, family members, those are all on the left side. 
And then you have other items on the right, research help to tell you what records might be relevant for that person's profile. You can go search for additional records. You can capture notes. You can see the latest changes and you can use other tools. So here's the full view of Rufus Tannehill McNair Sr. And you'll notice there are pencil icons peppered throughout the page. Here is where you go to make an edit. So you can click on that pencil icon and change what's there. Now, every time you do this, Family Search Family Tree is going to show you the last edit made, who made it, and when they made it. So this is telling me I made the last edit back in 2014, but if I wanted to change this today, I could do that. And it's going to ask me to submit a reason. That reason field is not required, but it's encouraged, right? But it's not required. Someone could just make a change and not substantiate it. Here is the sources view for another relative of mine, Andrew McNair. And fortunately, Andrew has 65 sources on his profile. That's a lot of sources. That's a good body of documentation to go along with the information that we know about Andrew. So the idea with Family Search Family Tree is sources aren't required, but they do encourage it. They definitely want people adding sources. And there are many different projects going to help add more sources to the One World Tree because they want the sources there. So when you look at a source, you have the option to either see this compact view or you can expand it and see more details. There are There is a tab for collaboration. And on here, we have notes and discussions. So if you want to add a note, you can do that. This is what you'll get on the screen. It'll ask you to give a title for your note and it's going to ask you to write what the note is. And you even have the option of specifying if you want this note to be an alert note. What that means is when the person visits the profile page, if it's an alert note, it's gonna show up at the very top, alert. Know this before you start to make changes. So Family Search recently implemented this. It used to be that people would use the life bio, the life biography section and say, do not edit this profile without you know, contacting me. But Family Search wants that to be a note. So they've, they've instituted this recently. And then discussions. This gives you the opportunity to engage in conversations with others. I posted an example just today for my ancestor Andrew here, because after all these years, I still don't know what that D initial stands for. So I put a discussion. What is Andrew's middle name? So anyone who comes to this profile, they know that this is an open conversation point and maybe they can engage in discussion with me about it. So those are good for collaboration, right? It's a collaborative tree. Memories. You can attach photos, audio files, documents, stories to a profile page. And I definitely encourage you to leverage the memories and do this. Um, this is my grandmother's profile page. I've added all kinds of memories. I think it goes on for another three rows to her profile because I want her record to be substantiated. And I have items in our own personal family collection that no one else is going to have. So I want to put it here. And I did. I do encourage you if you're adding memories to be as descriptive as you can. So this is my grandmother's birth certificate. And then I have the option on the side to put details. I can add a tag for a topic. So I've added the tag birth certificates. I'll show you why here shortly. I put the dates, I put the place, and I put the description. And now with my grandmother, as I'm sure many of us have this going on, she had two birthdays. There was the date on her birth certificate and there was a date she celebrated because she grew up thinking her birthday was one day, came to learn later it was a different day. So I added that as a part of the description. So be descriptive. Now, given that it's an open tree, open profile, and you can edit it, there are certain things that people can't do. When you add a memory, only you can do certain things with that memory. So this is just a picture I chose from another person in the project, David Lee Kuntz, and this is a picture that someone else added to the site. So I can do certain things with this picture. I can add tags. So if I wanted to, I could add a topic tag that says photograph. I can add it to my albums. I can add a story. But because I did not upload this picture, that's all I can do with it. I cannot delete this picture. So there are some things that are protected, even though this is a collaborative family tree. So you may say, well, what good is it going to do to have it there if someone deletes that person from the tree or they merge it inappropriately? Yeah, that could happen. But one thing that's not going to happen is that picture is not going to go away. So all the memories are searchable across the entire site. So I could type in Kuntz as I did here, 
there are 700 results and it's pulling memories, photos, videos, and photos, audio files, documents from anyone that's got the Coons name on it. So it becomes part of the collective searchable database and family search is committed to preserving it. So that's also helpful for collaboration. And just a sidebar, I wanted to show the timeline feature. This is the last item on that navigation bar of a person's profile page, because I think it's quite nice. So it takes all the locations, in this case, from my grandmother's record, and maps it on a Google map to show me where these events happen. And I even have the option to turn on a route so it shows me the order. So the first item on the list is where she was born in North Carolina. The last item in her route is where she's interred in a cemetery in Sarasota, not far from where I live. So it's able to show you that route. Now, important again, when collaborating is keeping up with the changes. So I definitely encourage people to take advantage of the fact that FamilySearch lets you have notifications. I get an email notification every week of changes that are occurring on the tree. So this is a little excerpt from the email. It says, you have new notifications. And so I'll open up the email and I can see what these notifications are. And one of them is I can see the changes to the tree. And it tells me a list of people and I can go further and see what those changes are. Now, the way you do this is by making sure you click that following link on a person's profile. So if you're working on a profile and you want to pay attention to what's happening with it, select following. Then you're able to monitor your following list. Now, I logged in today to capture a new screenshot, and this is actually perfect because the most recent change is to this Ithiel Conrad Clemens. Someone went in and was editing his profile just today. And... This is not a family member of mine, but he is a family friend. He's, he's a pastor of a church that my grandmother and my mother went to as they were growing up. So what you can do, the family search just initiated recently that I love is you can label and add notes for people on your following list. It used to be I would follow people and forget why I was following them because they were not all related to me, right? I do a lot of work to help with the tree, but sometimes I wanted to follow people and I'd forget, why am I following this person? But Family Search now has labels to help us track that. So if I select the three dots next to Ithiel's name, it shows me a list of labels that Family Search has already predefined, and I can create additional labels, up to 10, that I can use. So in this case, I may just choose something like uh, researching or, oh, no, Treehouse Compendium. Treehouse Compendium is my catch-all name for people I'm researching that are not related to me. So I could choose to add that label to him. So I did, Treehouse Compendium. Now, I can also add a note. So this note is fantastic because it helps me make sure I keep track of the reasons why I am following people. So in this case, I added a note. He's a long -term, long-time pastor of my grandmother, Alice, and my mommy. He's in the fan club. That's my personal note that I can see as I am tracking people. Okay, and the social feed. This is more recent with Family Search. They've just added this. Um, well, they added it about a year ago, but they did a nice blog post about it back in February. So we'll make sure we have the link to this um, when we post the video online. But the Family Tree social feed is, is a way to share with your families who you invite to the tree to keep track of what you're doing, share your discoveries, share your findings, and it's a social feed. So you can pull in information, you can connect to different profiles on the tree and share that with anyone that you have set up sharing with. I won't go into all the details, you can read more in the blog post. All right, so to summarize the three platforms, I put together this chart to, as a quick reference. So when we think about the concept of openness, Wikitree, most profiles are open to edit, but they do have this trusted list concept. Genie, most profiles are public and can be openly edited. Family search, almost all profiles are open to edit. Although I should say for a deceased person, a living person, there's restrictions in place for a living person, but for a deceased person, they're all open with some exceptions. Cost, Wikitree is free, as is Family Search Family Tree. Genie has this additional pro account. Quality control. Both Wikitree and Genie have dedicated users in the community to you know, help us keep track and safeguard the information on the tree. Family search, not so much. I mean, there's people who help, but there's no dedicated team of people to help. And size, as I've reiterated throughout the presentation, Wikitree has about 33 million profiles, Genie 177 million, Family Search almost 1.5 billion. Now that said, family group, 
these one world family trees are collaborative and you can kind of think of them like group projects, right? And when you have a group project, there are certain principles that are important. Communication is key. Group members will have different levels of skill and commitment. You certainly see that played out on these collaborative tree platforms. And sometimes clashes will arise. And honestly, group work can be stressful and time consuming. So there are people who feel working on these trees is too stressful, too time consuming, don't wanna mess with it. And I completely respect that, right? This is not a platform that's for everyone or that everyone cares to invest the time and energy in. It's your personal preference. I wanna share with you a few examples of what has happened in my case. All right, I run out of, I see my time. Um, I think I have about five more minutes max. Do you think we're you are, okay? You are absolutely okay. fine. You have some privilege here, you know. <laughs> well, I still wanna be respectful, right? Okay. <laughs> so, all right, so I'll, I'll wrap this up, I promise. All right, I wanna share a couple of my experiences of dealing with information on the tree, a family search in particular. So <laughs> I was looking at a record from my ancestor, Rufus, Tannehill will the record for him. And I see that there's this child listed here, Harding McNair. I said, who's, who's Harding McNair? That's not one of the children I know for Rufus. And so I take a closer look and I see that this person who added it has done so because of an 1870 census record. So I say, okay. So I go look at the 1870 census record because I'm like, wait a minute, I know this record. There's no Harding on it. And I look and I see, okay, they have taken this name in the circle, which kind of looks like Harding, but I know it's not Harding. From my own working on the family tree, I know that that person's name is Sterling. And I have Sterling as one of the sons of Rufus. With Rufus had three different um, women that he was with over the course of his life. So he had one child with a woman named Millie, and that is Sterling. So I descend from one of the children he had with Mariah. So how do I know this? Well, I have personal accounts. This is a picture of a cousin of mine. Her name is Vernestine. She's passed away, unfortunately. But I have an email communication from the day I spoke to Vernestine back in 2007 and was telling my mom and my cousin, oh, I had this conversation with Vernestine. I just met her on, on the phone. And she told me about the family Bible record. So when I was on the phone with Vernestine, she had the pages of the Bible record in her hand. And the Bible record lays this out clearly that Rufus had a child with Millie named Sterling. Rufus had children with Mariah and it had their names. So she was reading it off the Bible pages. I don't have the Bible pages, but she was reading it to me during that conversation. And I then recounted that to my mother. So I don't have the original source, right? I have a accounting of the source, but I don't have the original source. So what would be my next steps? Well, I wanna consider what sources I do have. Some circumstantial evidence that I have is that the name Sterling is repeated a million times in our family tree. It's a name that got repeated by the sons, by the brothers of Sterling. Uh, see, in that list I showed you, there were like 15 kids, like six or seven boys, each one of them named a son Sterling. So the name Sterling is repeated in the tree. So I have that. So I might add that or an accounting of that. I might add an accounting of my conversation with Vernestine that she was reading to me off the Bible page. So I think about what additional sources could I add to substantiate what I know. Then I would go ahead and make those changes. And then I would reach out to the person who incorrectly put that there. Now, when I reach out to other volunteers, my overall strategy is that my first message is a general one. I don't say you have it wrong. I say, hi, I saw you're working on the profile. I would love to connect. I'm interested in knowing how you might be connected or are you related? You know, can we, can we continue the conversation? So that's the first message I send. I don't say that's wrong. <laughs> so I try to keep it positive and have a nice hello greeting. Um, it doesn't always work, I know, but that's a strategy that I take. Another example. One of my grandfather's brothers was named Leroy Koontz. And Leroy is buried literally four gravestones or something from my grandfather. Now, when I looked at the profile page for Leroy, I noticed something odd. <laughs> Someone had put the incorrect headstone to him and had him buried in a cemetery at County Over. So I started looking more closely and I said, okay, I see why they did this. This other Leroy, also was born in 1933 and also died in 1997. So the person had just kind of quickly gone through and attached that cemetery record to 
the Leroy that I'm related to because I'm not related to this other one. So what I did was I made the corrections. I added substantiation. So I changed the burial data information um, and I put a picture. I'll show you the picture in a second. I put my picture of Leroy's headstone and I put my note saying he's not buried in Haiti Cemetery. He was my grandfather's brother and I've stood by his grave in the cemetery. Mitchell Cemetery is where a lot of my Coons family is buried. And then I attached my picture of the correct headstone for this Leroy. Then I reached out to the volunteer, explained, you know, again, hi, I saw you're you know, working on the record. May I ask how you're interested? I'm related. So she started conversing back with me. And I said, well, I noticed you had an incorrect headstone. I like this, you know, I made the edits because I've been to this headstone and I explained. And she goes, oh, my mistake, I did it too quickly. I wasn't really, you know, I was just trying to help. So she honestly was just trying to help and made a mistake. That will happen. So again, more world family trees are not your family tree. Your people are on it. So what can you do? Make sure you keep your own database, right? That is absolutely what we need to be doing. Let's not rely on these one world trees to be the tree that we use. In my case, I use Ritz Magic and I share my family tree data to multiple places, including Family Search. Now, the reason I share and contribute to Family Search is because I might have information that no one else does. I wanna share with you this postcard that I attached several years ago that was sent to me. And this postcard was written by a young woman in Nashville, Tennessee. And she's talking about the passing of her father because she's writing to her father's sister. I was able to identify who she was, who her father was and who her aunt was and attach this all to their profiles on Family Search Family Tree. One of the unique features about this postcard is in mentioning her father's death date, I was able to provide that. His death date was not added or not anywhere else online. In fact, he died in 1913. And in Nashville, or in the state of Tennessee, there was this weird break in death certificates. There were death certificates statewide from 1908 to 1912. Then there was a state law that happened in 1913. No death certificates were recorded. And then they picked back up in 1914. So with this postcard, I was able to substantiate this guy's death date during a time period where there are no state or very few statewide death records. So I added that to the tree. And in fact, I have received multiple emails over the years of people who found it, who are related to them, and thanking me for that contribution. Because we will have legacies and stories that are lost and disconnected. And contributing to the idea of a, contributing to a collaborative tree could be one way to make those connections again. I also have a blog post I did about a series of postcards that I was able to identify who they were addressed to. I wrote a case study about her life because I was able to research her. And guess what I did with those postcards? I put them all on her family search profile. Imagine how helpful this could be to a family member of hers that's not ever seen these, but these are all addressed to Ella um, from different people, including some cousins. I could see some of them said cousin, and you know I could see that, although I haven't identified them, but I contributed it because I want it out there. In fact, when I went to the antique store last weekend, these are the postcards that I ended up buying. Why? Because almost all of them are addressed. That's what I do. I love working with old postcards and trying to attach them or send them back to their, make them available for others. So every collaborative world tree family site is going to be different. I hope that by going through the features of Wiki Tree, Genie, and Family Search, you know, you've been able to learn some features that maybe you didn't know. Think about ways you can further contribute and collaborate because, as Edward said, give to the world the best you have and the best will come back to you. That's been my disposition when working with these collaborative trees. I want to give to the world because you know what? I might get a genealogy gift back one day just because. So I try to think about it that way. And I'm happy to answer the questions. So I'm sorry for going over, but I do hope that's been somewhat of a help. Tania, I don't know why you're apologizing. Let's <laughs> give Tania a big hand. You guys feel free to come on back on camera. Uh, awesome. You clapping for her. 